So it's called Center for Sustainable Economy. It's based in Port Townsend, Washington. So. He's, he's a president and the, I think chief economist and works with nonprofits and governments uh, discussing and presenting uh, economic uh, uh, solutions for what's going on here regarding climate change. And with that, John, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Mike. And um, great to see everybody. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to boot up my PowerPoint now. And here we go. So, um, yeah, so most of you by now have probably gotten the memo that, uh, you know, clear cutting industrial uh, logging practices are really not so great for our climate and climate change. Uh, but if you haven't gotten the memo, I'll spend a little bit of time reviewing the evidence and then jump into some of the economic policy tools uh, available to address the problem and drastically scale up uh, climate smart solutions, which is uh, a lot of what the work at uh, CSC is about these days. So uh, to begin with, it's always important to define terms. Um, uh, the term industrial forest practices, industrial logging, it doesn't include the small scale extraction of wood by family foresters, uh, small community and tribal organizations, land trusts, and most conservation organizations. Uh, what we're talking about is the large scale intensive extraction of wood by Wall Street and increasingly foreign investor owned corporations that rely almost exclusively on clear cutting, dense networks of logging roads, chemicals, fertilizers, slash burning, and heavy machinery, all to fuel mass consumption of wood products across the nation and the world. What these entities are doing is not really forestry, uh, is it? But it's tree farming, and it makes a big difference to climate and biodiversity. So the scale of the damage is mind boggling and uh, is being felt in every part of the U.S. Take a look at the landscapes near Richmond, Virginia on the right, Hot Springs, Hot Springs Arkansas in the center, and Seaside, Oregon uh, on the left. Everything in red has been clear cut in the past 20 years. Wow. Here's a close up of the, note the labyrinth of logging roads that goes along with uh, uh, these, this clear cutting pattern. Uh, here's a uh, close up, and you've probably seen this picture, um, from a drinking watershed on the Oregon coast, Jetty Creek. My takeaway message um, is that the climate consequences of this economic activity are severe and long lasting and are putting constant upward pressure on CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere at the very time in history when climate scientists are telling us that we need to do everything we can to protect forests and draw down CO2 back below the scientific upper limit of 350 parts per million. So to understand the why industrial tree farming is so bad for climate, it's important to distinguish between the forest carbon dynamics we inherited from nature with the industrial tree farming model that has replaced it over so much of the land. So the top panel, uh, panel A, represents the natural forest carbon cycle Natural forests in various age classes pull in massive amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere, give off some through disturbances like fire uh, and you know, decomposition and, and uh, insect uh, damage, et cetera, but end up pulling in far more than they give off for quite a long time, for thousands of years, in fact, and store most of that carbon underground soils, or about half of it actually, uh, which rely on dense networks of underground mycorrhizal fungi to transfer carbon out of the vegetation above into the soil below. In one recent study, researchers traced this process as it continually built up Midwestern forest carbon stocks for at least 8,000 years, and probably back to the beginning of the current interglacial period. So think of nature's baseline forest carbon dynamics as a catch and store regime. Now think of the industrial forest carbon cycle panel B as the opposite, uh, a catch, release, and deplete regime. Clear cuts deforest the land, release stored carbon into the atmosphere, and create carbon sequestration dead zones that give off rather than capture carbon. Plantations absorb carbon for a while, but then they are cut down, converted into wood products by industrial processes, that release both fossil and the vast majority of biogenic carbon stored in trees. 
And by fossil fuel carbon, I mean associated with the like machinery and industrial processes. The soil carbon accumulation process comes to a halt and then reverses as forest productivity declines and soil carbon bleeds off the land through erosion, such as the logging road in, in, the, in the picture below. So the land is also made more susceptible to wildfires, which give off more carbon than they would otherwise. So as a result of this process, carbon stores are depleted quite uh, quickly. Now, in that same Western study I was talking about a minute ago, the researchers found that after accumulating carbon for over 8,000 years, the lands lost most of these carbon stocks in just 150 years due to logging and, uh, and conversion to agriculture. So this degradation of nature's forest carbon cycle is well reflected in a variety of metrics, and none of this is seriously dis disputed. Uh, they can be divided into two camps, the metrics um, associated with. The first camp being the ways in which industrial tree farming drives climate change by pumping up atmospheric CO2 levels. And the second camp being the ways clear cutting and timber plantations are making the land more susceptible to climate change. But the basic story is this. Number one, industrial tree farming results in far less carbon being stored in the land, far greater greenhouse gas emissions, and far less carbon sequestration than nature's baseline. Number two, landscapes dominated by clear cuts, tree plantations, and logging roads are far more vulnerable to a variety of climate stressors. They increase fire risk, deplete water supplies, increase water temperatures, degrade water quality, amplify heat waves, and increase threats from flooding and landslide. Those are all stressors that are already on the rise uh, due to climate change, but this industrial forest landscape is making them worse. And finally, number three, with limited time here, we, can, we can't do a deep dive in any of these, but I can give you a sneak peek as to the data and the information out there. Um, so let's start with uh, carbon storage. Everywhere in the US, logging of the original forest has released many billion tons of CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gases uh, into the atmosphere and created a major carbon storage deficit from the land. In the Pacific Northwest, and you know, this picture is, is from, from uh, the Cascades in Washington, the town of the Cascades of Washington, back near the turn of the last century. Just think of these giant chunks of CO2 on, on the log trucks. Uh, all that is going to the atmosphere. And through about 1990, uh, researchers concluded that this process of logging the old growth, uh, the old growth forest, that, that, uh, uh, the original forest here, generated about 5.5 gigatons of carbon from the land uh, to the atmosphere. And that's just in the Pacific Northwest. So the most intensively logged lands now exhibit forest carbon stocks, which are measure, measured in tons, metric tons per acre, that are about one third of what used to exist in our old growth forest. So that's a major carbon storage deficit on the land. It has also created a carbon sequestration deficit, and a lot of people don't really understand this point, uh, with the most heavily logged lands, and this is an example from Western Oregon, now barely breaking even on carbon accumulation every year, while natural forests probably pulled in about six or seven tons CO2 per acre per year for every ton given off by wildfire or decay. Uh, the difference shown here at about six tons CO2 per acre per year is the amount of CO2 no longer being taken out of the atmosphere um, by real forests that plantations have replaced, uh, which of course drives up CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Now, one of the reasons uh, carbon sequestration capacity on landscapes dominated by industrial tree plantations is so much less than a natural forest is because of what I call carbon sequestration dead zones. Logging roads and recently clear-cut lands that have stopped capturing carbon altogether and are in fact giving it off. So as shown in this graph on the left of net ecosystem productivity, which is the best measure of carbon sequestration. Uh, and, and this graph shows what happens to net ecosystem productivity before and after logging. Um, as you can see, um, these dead zones, these time, the time when uh, um, net ecosystem productivity goes negative, which means the land's giving off more carbon than it's taken in, it lasts for about 10 to 15 years after a forest is clear cut. And in these clear cuts, again, the, the, the land gives off more carbon than it can capture as dead branches, needles, stumps, and slash decay, or are burned in slash burning. Uh, 
uh, and also as the soil begins to release its vast stores. So importantly, the extent of these dead zones increases as the timber rotation falls, the amount of time between clear cutting falls. Like for example, at a 40 year rotation, and you can see this on the chart on the, on the right, uh, at a 40 year rotation, about one third of the land at any one time is in this carbon dead zone status. It becomes a source, not a sink. And you know, recall that slide a couple of slides back of the red. <laughs> all those recent clear cut areas are giving off more carbon than they're pulling in. So this is a big problem. This is why the industrial forest landscape takes in so much less carbon than, uh, than natural forests. So and because of this, while uh, long rotations still create these dead zones, their aerial extent, um, when, you, when you have a longer harvest rotation, is about half of what it would be at a 40 year rotation, which has major implications for forest policy. And so we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So industrial tree farming has greatly reduced both carbon stocks on the grant land and carbon sequestration relative to nature's baseline. But what about emissions? Well, nature doesn't log. So all of the greenhouse gas emissions triggered by logging activities is excess CO2 entering the atmosphere that wasn't there um, under natural forest conditions, obviously. And it's not hard to calculate these emissions. Uh, and, and, and you know, I spend half my time on a daily basis crunching these kind of numbers. So you know, here's some of the, the major sources of emissions associated with logging. So trees are half carbon by weight. And when they're, when they're cut down and turned into wood products and eventually disposed of in landfills, 75 to 80% of the original carbon in the forest ends up in the atmosphere as the wood decays. Clear cuts, as we just discussed, give, uh, give off rather than sequester carbon. And after logging, sites are often burned, then sprayed. Soil carbon runs off from, uh, from logging roads and unstable soils. Uh, in addition, the whole process is highly mechanized and lots of fossil fuel uh, fuels are burned and CO2 combusted, you know, entering the atmosphere from that along the way. So in a study we completed in 2017, um, we found that just on the biogenic carbon alone, uh, Oregon's logging related emissions were by far the largest single source of CO2 in the state. A year later, OSU put out a now well-known study corroborating our figures. But unfortunately, these biogenic releases of carbon from industrial logging are not counted at all in Oregon's greenhouse gas inventory, nor are they counted in any other state. Uh, so this is a big problem for carbon policy, is that we're completely ignoring these, you know, enormous releases of biogenic carbon uh, from industrial logging activities. So that's kind of the run, um, that's kind of the lay of the land when it comes to that first uh, uh, tranche of climate impacts, the ones that are driving up CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. The second tranche is all of the ways in which these industrial forest landscapes are making the land more susceptible to climate change. Uh, for instance, uh, let's talk about uh, heat waves. Um, well, heavily clear-cut landscapes, as you probably know, are far hotter and drier than natural forests they've replaced. They create rural heat islands, so to speak, and the effect is dramatic. In a study uh, done back in the early 80s, researchers meticulously compared and contrasted surface temperatures in clear-cut partial cut and uncut forests. Mm -hmm. The eye popping results are shown here. On hot summer days, open clear cuts can be 40 degrees hotter than the neighboring forest floor, greatly elevating heat risk for reforestation workers, hikers, or anyone else nearby. Then let's move on to water shortages. Industrial tree plantations also make water shortages much worse and more uh, in, in both aerial extent and the amount of water that's being cut off. Um, so you've probably heard um, famous studies done uh, by OSU, uh, Perry and Jones, and, uh, uh, which corroborated an earlier study, basically found that uh, consistently documented that a 50% decrease in dry season water supply when natural forests are uh, converted into industrial tree plantations. What about wildfire risk? Well, contrary to what the timber industry argues, industrial tree farming does not reduce but increases fire risk. Tree plantations are smaller diameter, homogenous, and densely stocked. And when they burn, they burn hotter and faster than the natural forest they've replaced, 
putting the lives of firefighters and nearby homeowners at risk. And this effect was uh, uh, documented by PSU researchers uh, after the 2020 mega fires. They also found this exact same thing. While the fires in natural forests were definitely severe, they were patchy and they moved slow. When they hit the uh, industrial forest landscape, they took off, they ran much faster down the hillsides, they were much harder to fight. So, so we're increasing fire risk at a time when climate change is already increasing fire risk. And then what about on the other end of the spectrum when we get, uh, you know, when we get atmospheric rivers that are prolonged, uh, you know, prolonged atmospheric rivers for several days in a row, well, this exacerbates flooding risk. Um, heavily clear-cut landscapes um, has been shown to increase landslide, landslide risk by 200, 400% uh, relative to nature's baseline. So anyway, so these are some of the ways in which industrial logging practices are amplifying the effects of climate change. And there are many more, but enough of the bad news. So uh, let's turn to you know, what some of the solutions are and what economic policy instruments we have uh, to, to move us towards those solutions. So the overarching solution is what's known as climate smart forestry. A lot of people don't like that term, but for better or for worse, that is the term that uh, uh, has been embraced by the federal government. And, uh, and, and, and I, think, I still think it's an apt, uh, apt description of what we need to do. We need to be smart about the climate impacts of logging. So unlike tree farming, climate smart forestry is more in line with the notion of an honorable harvest. Uh, as author Robin Kimmerer has so eloquently described in Brady of Sweetgrass, uh, where we take what we need from the land, but leave a functioning forest behind. Climate smart practices include a variety of techniques capable of advancing four distinct climate goals simultaneously, which are reducing emissions, increasing carbon stored in the land, enhancing carbon sequestration, and making the man land more resilient to climate change. They include techniques like variable density thinning, uh, afforestation, ecological restoration of plantations, long rotation, setting aside the most productive uh, forest lands as forest carbon reserves, and uh, proforestation, a term coined by uh, uh, Bill Mumau, uh, uh, IPP, famous IPCC scientist, which really means just letting forests grow to their natural ecological potential. Variable density thinning is a really encouraging um, alternative to clear cutting that I think is, is a climate smart technique. It involves uh, you know, cutting uh, individually and in clumps, kind of mimicking nature's uh, disturbance pattern, but leaving an intact uh, forest canopy behind. Um, so all, all four of these climate goals can be advanced by, by these kind of techniques, reducing emissions, increasing carbon sequestration, improving resiliency and increasing carbon stored in the land. Variable density thing is a good technique for doing that in plantations. We're not talking about cutting natural forests. We're talking about cutting uh, existing, existing densely stocked plantations with, with this technique. So how do we make climate smart, smart forestry the rule rather than the exception? Um, well, the good news is that there are many economic policy tools available to decision makers at the federal, state, and local level, local level to do that. So here's a few that I think are most important. Demand reduction, of course. Uh, the amount of wood we waste is astonishing. Market-based mechanisms such as subsidy reform, forest carbon taxes, and cap and trade, those are other ones. How about limiting ownership of our prime forest and farmland by short-sighted corporate investors and replacing them with owners who have the long-term perspective, multi-generations in mind? using the land use tools such as no net loss and zoning to protect public health and safety. Uh, we think uh, local agencies, counties actually have authority uh, under their land use, uh, under land use laws to restrict where these industrial tree plantations can be. They don't have the authority to issue new forest practice rules, that's preempted, but they do have the ability to regulate where those practices take place. Yeah, and then finally, uh, within the context of natural resource damage litigation, um, there are laws on the book that would allow the state to um, sue logging companies to recover the damages to, say, drinking water supplies, which you probably 
uh, seen quite a quite a bit about. Uh, there's been many articles documenting the immense damages to drinking water supplies throughout the state caused by clear cutting operations. We think the state actually has the authority to go try to get money to repair that damage. So those are some of, uh, that's kind of a longer list. Let's just dive into just a few of these um, uh, uh, to, to get a little better sense of where, of, of where we can go. So waste, yeah, re, you know, waste reduction. Obviously, um, about 51% of the trees cut in this country at this time go to pulp, paper, packaging, and other kind of low-end use, uses of wood that would can easily be replaced by other substitutes. If you can take into account, uh, and yeah, so uh, literally one out of every two trees are cut down for, for these uses. Urban sprawl and oversized houses also represent a wasteful use of the resource. We can definitely build smaller, more tasteful houses and not use so much wood. Now, in contrary, and, and so what about getting, what about these substitutes? We've heard all along that, well, wood is, should be substituted for concrete and steel. It's so much more carbon friendly alternative. Well, it's not actually true. When you actually account for the biogenic carbon releases in, and the fossil fuel releases associated with different products, uh, conventional uh, wood products uh, score extremely high on the carbon intensity scale. Um, a ton of wood that arrives at a job site you know, under, under this, uh, and these are some of the calculations from a recent paper a few of us have put out. Uh, a ton of wood that arrives at a job site comes with a carbon price tag of about eight or nine tons CO2, while concrete and steel, uh, according to life cycle assessments done over and over again, uh, are roughly in the 2.5 to 1.5 range in terms of carbon release per ton of product. Woody biomass has been shown to be more carbon intensive than coal for electricity, at least certain types of coal. Uh, and alternative papers like hemp, canaf, or bamboo are far less carbon intensive as well. So demand reduction involves not only reducing waste, but substituting these less carbon intensive inputs whenever possible, which of course is turning what you've heard on its head. And this is uh, something we, we really need to uh, keep hammering on because we just keep hearing about uh, mass timber, cross laminated timber, substituting timber for concrete and steel is what we need to do. No, it's just not true at all. Climate smart wood, yes, uh, would have a much lower carbon in, uh, car carbon footprint, but conventional lumber is extremely carbon intensive. So let's now talk about some of the market-based mechanisms that are available. Um, forest carbon tax and reward. I'm actually uh, submitting a paper with some colleagues next week on the idea of taxing the uh, emissions associated with uh, industrial logging practices and using the tax proceeds to invest in climate smart alternatives. Uh, the money would go into a forest carbon uh, incentive fund that would be used to reward climate smart uh, practices on non-industrial lands. We had a bill drafted in the 2017 legislature to implement this. Um, Obviously it hasn't moved, but it's good to have it on the books as an example of what can be done to regulate the greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, from industrial logging. And what about uh, cap and trade? Uh, a forest carbon cap and trade is another strategy to consider. Here we would establish a declining cap on emissions with the goal of cutting logging levels in half by 2050, uh, perhaps by eliminating the practice of cutting down trees for paper and woody biomass energy. And as with existing offset programs, a portion of an entity's compliance obligations in a given year could be met by purchasing offset credits generated by substituting hemp fiber, bamboo, carbon negative concrete, and other less carbon intensive products for wood. So another market-based solution is having a no net loss compensatory mitigation program to address the conversion of prime forest and farmland to development like we now have for wetlands. So here's how it might work using a local development project uh, up here in Port Townsend as an example. Uh, we would calculate both the carbon removed by development and the stream of sequestration being displaced over a given time period, say, say 100 years. Uh, we call that foregone carbon sequestration. Uh, the developer would be required to pay into a fund to protect or restore a carbon equivalent amount of forest or farmland uh, elsewhere and ensure that those lands were enrolled in long-term carbon storage agreement. 
So this is something we can use uh, to deal with the land use conversion urbanization threat to our forests. And as I talked about before, another, another um, policy that can be implemented by county governments is land use and zoning. Through land use plans and zoning, there's a good case to be made that counties have the authority, and I've said this before, to restrict tree farming where other types of farming takes place on our agricultural lands and reserve forest lands for climate smart forestry. I believe a county can actually do this as long as it's properly documented that this is um, related to uh, public health and safety. So it'll help, you know, doing some, you know, regulating where these industrial tree farms uh, can be put on the land will help reduce the public health and safety risk from wildfires, heat waves, landslides, floods, chemical contamination, and depleted water supplies. So anyway, I, I could go on for, for an hour more on these tools, but I think I'll cut it off there and uh, say thank you and uh, take any questions you might have. John, <clears throat> what can our organization do uh, and what can we do as individuals to uh, uh, address this problem? and support solutions? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, and, um, and, and it intrigues me that you're engineers <laughs> and engineers uh, are involved in buildings and designing buildings. And um, one of the things we knew we really need to do is uh, dispel this myth that mass timber products are more uh, or less carbon intensive than than steel and concrete and other substitute, you know, other, other uh, building material substitutes. And um, we've started a uh, peer review paper and it probably won't be out till summer. Um, that's going to go down, you know, uh, material by material by, by material and kind of do like, the, like I did in that slide and list, uh, you know, identify what the real carbon intensity is of all these different materials um, as used in a construction site. So, so if anyone wants to volunteer um, and be involved in that project, it's kind of a, you know, an analysis of these different substitutes and the carbon intensity. That'd be a great thing for, for uh, to work with some engineers on. Um, and then, you know, just in, just in terms of, of, of um, uh, general things we could do, um, we we're, we're way behind on passing state level legislation. That really needs to happen. The Oregon Global Warming Commission uh, can certainly uh, use voices saying it's about time we. We started reporting logging and wood product sector emissions on par with other sectors. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot that can be done uh, um, just by ordinary citizens participating in the processes that are out there. Is, is there any legislation being considered in the 2023 uh, Oregon session uh, that addresses any of this? Well, unfortunately, not that, not that I'm aware of. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, I haven't moved up to Washington uh, it's required me to kind of unplug a little bit from the, the Oregon legislative scene. Um, and, but up, up, I could say up here, uh, we're mainly fighting defense. Like, believe it or not, the timber industry has submitted a bill that would basically declare that its materials are superior to any other materials mm -hmm. in terms of carbon intensity and climate and require the state to to use them in all state funded uh, construction projects. Yeah. That's the kind of yeah. Those are the kind of things we have to deal with uh, on, on 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 an annual basis uh, because the industry is super well funded. They 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 could spend they don't have any qualms uh, writing fifteen bills even if they know none of them will pass just to tie up people's time. So this is what we're up against. We we have a couple of. Uh or at least one chat question there, John. Yeah. What is carbon negative concrete? Oh, carbon negative, yeah, that's pretty cool. They, um, I mean, it turns out that uh, concrete actually absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere over, um, uh, you know, I, I am not an engineer on this, but um, there's ways to design it where it will actually amplify that effect and, at the end of the day, you've absorbed more carbon through the building uh, than you have emitted along the way of making the concrete in the first place. Um, now, I'm not an expert in that, but it is a very promising, um, from what I've read, it's a very promising technology. Yeah, and that's exactly somebody in the chat, you know, they, it, 
whoever it was designated uh, emissions from like burning wood as carbon neutral and that's stuck and people are fighting against that tooth and nail nationally. Um, and it seems like they've done it in Oregon as well. And that's, it's just, you know, we need to repeal. If there's a bill that has done that, that's the, that's the kind of bill that should just be repealed. And uh, instead, um, everything, all these materials, whether it's fuel or building materials, should be compared honestly, um, life cycle, you know, life cycle analysis to life cycle analysis. Um, so we actually get a real picture. We can't just be um, passing policies that declare any 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 material as as carbon neutral. When I grew up, my my father had uh, purchased a farm uh, close by, and the owner of that farm had quite a few trees on it, and he harvested the trees every ten years. He got the, got the big ones out and left the rest of it. Uh, you know, to, to continue growing. I assume from what you said that that was a pretty good climate uh, policy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and what happens when you do that kind of selective uh, low impact logging um, is you're leaving the soil carbon intact, you're leaving the, the, the sequestration capacity intact. Whereas if you clear cut it, um, again, for 10 to 15 years after clear cutting, the land's giving off more carbon than taking in. Uh, and then, then, then you lose all that carbon from the soil. So, yeah, yeah. So there's some hands up. Do you want to call on them, Ed? Or, I mean, uh, Mike, or should you? Hey, Pat, you had your hand up first. Why don't you go first? Sure, thanks. Um, John, very good talk. I really appreciate it. Um, my one question has to do with, um, and I want to come back to some Oregon bills, but my one question has to do with your um, emission intensity for construction lumber, which is dominated by the biogenic portion of those emissions. How much of that is embedded in the actual wood products that are going to last anywhere from 20 to 100 years? Well, no, those, that, it took that into account. So those carbon intensity figures that I showed you took into account the 20% or so of the original tree carbon that would still exist in a hundred years in building materials. And so it's roughly 20%. Hmm. Okay. So that's, that's the biogenic carbon released. Yeah. That's not counting the carbon that's gonna be released by that pile of lumber itself. It's just assuming that that's locked in place for a hundred years. We're talking about the all mm -hmm. the all the carbon that was released getting like creating that product in the first place. Creating that product. You know, and, okay. and as a cross check of these figures, you know, some people are like, where, where did you get these numbers? Just think about it. It takes about three to four tons of wood to make a ton of lumber. And, and so so those three tons that are discarded as waste, I mean, think of the, the needles and branches and you know, all that tonnage. That's short-term release. That's all released into the atmosphere. And since that's like half carbon by weight. You can do the math. That's like already just looking at that is nine mm -hmm. tons of carbon dioxide per ton of product, which is way above what we hear about for steel and concrete. Great. Uh, with regards to Oregon, there is a bill, Senate Bill 530, that Senator Dembro is sponsoring. It is the Natural Working Lands or Healthy, Healthy Forests Bill, I believe is what it's called. Uh, it's going to try to implement most of the carrots uh, incentives in the Global Warming Commission's plan. Uh, there is a move by Representative Gamba to strengthen that and to put in some more requirements um, into that bill. So that is something that if you're interested, people should be tracking here in Oregon. Yeah, what's the, what's the bill number? Senate Bill 530. 530, okay, yeah, let's take a look at it, yeah. So hey, uh, I'm Adam Rittenauer. I uh, I'm one of those engineers that is involved in the building industry, electrical engineer. Um, nice. And it, it struck me as very interesting in your presentation because I'm I mean I've dealt with lots of buildings that have like environmental uh, certification programs like LEED or Living Building Challenge or those kinds of things, and they usually get credit for using quote unquote sustainable you know materials such as mass timber and those kind of things as far as in their, you know, um, emissions, you know, embodied emissions for those buildings. Uh, 
So I'm wondering if it's one way we could, you know, move forward is try to like contact these accreditation programs and figure out where they're getting their numbers from as far as like, you know, uh, the climate benefits of using wood and try to, you know, incentivize using other materials that way. Yeah, I mean, it's a real thorny problem because a lot of these accreditation agencies or standards agencies or whatever, they've kind of bought the timber industry's line, uh, you know, hook, line and sinker. They've, they've taken the, um, and, 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 and the reality is they're right if you just limit consideration of fossil fuel related emissions, right? Because the carbon intensity of, of mass timber, you know, any timber product is going to be lower than steel or concrete if, if all you consider are the fossil fuel emissions. And that's all they do. They just assume away. There's actually something called the carbon neutrality assumption that's invoked to get rid of um, that big chunk on, 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 the, on, the, on the chart, the green, <laughs> just, just get rid of it all together. They just literally pass policies that say, well, it's going to grow back, so we don't really need to count it. I mean, that's essentially what they're arguing. Uh, John, John uh, you have uh, <clears throat> talked about industrial uh, process here, and I assume that most of our lumber comes from these large industrial plants as opposed to family farm type thing or a smaller. Is, is that true? Yeah, it's absolutely true. In in Oregon, it's uh, I, mean, I, I have the numbers nearby, but it's something like 70% of the supply is from you know, from the industrial lands. Um, okay. Yeah. So so there's another another note here from Alan Vernet saying that the public hearing for SB 530 is February 15th in the, in the Senate Committee on Natural Resources. Did, could you say more, uh, Alan? Um, I, well, I, I don't know what more to say. Um, it's, it's, it's an excellent bill. And if anybody is interested in, in exploring it, um, just check Senate Bill 530. It, it, it's, it's designed to promote carbon sequestration in our natural and working lands. It's a very good bill. We should really support it. And uh, Jeff Golden is the chair of the Senate Committee on Natural Resources. He's a major supporter of the bill. Michael Dembro is one is as uh, Pat mentioned is the lead uh, sponsor of the bill, um, and it deserves some very positive comments. If folks folks have the time to send some testimony in, or even stop by the the hearing, although I'm I'm guessing Pat and I and a lot of people will be there in line to make a few positive comments. But the more the better. Yeah. No. I would focus on a bill like that, it's some, you know, because of the, um, you know, the games they play with carbon accounting, uh, it's very important to ask some like very direct questions about the bill. Is this going to reduce clear cutting? Is this going to reduce the amount of wood we take off? Um, and if they say no to those, I would be very suspicious of it. But if they say yes to those questions, then it's probably a good bill. So. Well, one of the one of the key elements of the bill is I'm going to guess that the folks who were developing the bill would have exactly the points you are making, John, as in their in their minds. But uh, one of the problems with incorporating those kinds of things into bills, as you will appreciate, is that they is the more details you put into a bill, the more. Um, more items there are for the opponents to flag and use as ammunition. And so I, the, the, the bill does not specifically preclude uh, any particular management or um, identify any particular management strategy as being what they, what they favor. It's simply designed to promote carbon sequestration. And, uh, you know, the, the details come later, I guess, when the generalizations are enacted. But I think everybody would agree with you in terms of clear cutting and rotations. Certainly all the conversations I've had with folks who support the bill uh, are thinking those are what we have to do. Good. Yeah, 
John, I mean, uh, Alan, thanks for that. And I'm not really the, uh, the an expert in this area. Uh, Catherine Thomason and 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 Rand Shank are really our experts in the area, and they're following it much more closely than I. But my understanding is that it's primarily incentives, particularly to small forest owners, to extend rotations, um, as as well as gearing up for actually measuring, I believe, the carbon forest intensities and and bringing some of the metrics that you would like to see Im implemented, John, to, to the fore. Uh, that, that's yeah, my limited understanding. Yeah, John made the point very well that one of the problems that we have, certainly in Oregon across the country, is the state agencies like Oregon's DEQ have authority to, uh, to measure and regulate greenhouse gas emissions in certain areas. And because it's so um, tendentious, contentious, the idea even of measuring the amount of carbon officially in our forests is something that would be very difficult to get through the legislature because folks would say, ah, that's a slippery slope. Yeah, we think um, there may be a legal strategy to, to kind of force their hand. Um, and that legal strategy uh, involves Clean Air Act legislation and and petitioning. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the 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 uh, greenhouse gas pollution associated with logging wood products is a major source of pollution of a of a of a kind that has already been found to endanger public health and safety. Greenhouse gas. So so just not regulating a major source of a pollutant that has puts public health and safety at risk um, is not allowed under under the Clean Air Act. I don't want to get, get too many too many details uh, in, in, for this conversation, but I do think there's a way to leverage uh, calculation of those emissions, and we're going to be moving forward with a petition to do that at some point relatively soon. And Senate Bill 530 does indeed uh, uh, provi provide the authority to at least do an inventory. Yeah, yeah, see, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I have a, a question um, in terms of the logging industry as it is today, um, if that were to all transition over to climate smart forestry, um, could the industry survive? And how does it um, compare with say steel and, uh, and the cement that you mentioned um, and other building materials, if the wood does come from uh, climate smart forestry practices? Yeah, excellent questions. And um, uh, like I said, we are working in a paper uh, on that. And I think um, the climate smart wood would probably be comparable to, to steel and concrete, um, at least, you know, again, we're, we're saying you got to count the biogenic. So, um, so at least be comparable there. But in terms of can industry survive, um, I'm just wrapping up a paper where we've done a um, uh, forest land investor model of business as usual versus a forest carbon tax versus enrolling in carbon markets. And we looked at net present value, internal rate of return, the usual um, stuff. And as it turns out, it's not gonna be a disaster at all for, for major forest land owners. In fact, um, if they embrace carbon markets, uh, and earn money through carbon and timber. Um, yeah, there'll be some reduced yield. Yeah, we'll be using like variable density thinning instead of clear cutting, but you get a lot of benefit from doing that. The trees grow bigger. You have more um, volume per acre, more yield per acre. So your costs go down for, for producing the same amount of supply and you're earning revenues from carbon. So at the end of the day, um, we think that uh, uh, in terms of a, uh, an asset class, investing in forest lands that are managed on climate smart principles is doesn't show it doesn't doesn't show exactly the you know the same return as it would you know the, the typical forest land investment does today but it's pretty darn close and i think there's a lot of investors who would feel comfortable with earning a slightly lower rate of return we're talking like you know as opposed to 7 percent internal rate of return of 6% or 5% internal rate of return. There's plenty of investors, patient capital investors who would think that's a fair trade-off because I'm in it for the long run. 
So, um, I, I, you know, the results are encouraging. And like I said, this paper will be out uh, within two months or so. Yeah. That's encouraging. And um, so you're saying that, that basically the industry needs to be restructured rather than done away with. And, you know, if you do value, just like many things have been externalized in the economic models, and now we're starting to internalize those factors um, and, and place value on uh, carbon sequestration and carbon emissions. Um, if we put those things into the model, all of a sudden the economic picture looks different. And um, so I, I think that's really awesome. And, and that there's a, a, a rapidly growing pool of investors who care about things like that. Absolutely. And like I said, are willing to accept um, you know, one or two percent shade, you know, uh, shaved off their profits in exchange for these, um, knowing that they're doing good on the land. So, I'm, yeah, I'm so valuing, yeah, valuing these things and being able to account for them, um, I think is is the biggest hurdles. Um, and, and sort of going at it from a, a sort of regulatory angle, um, is, is a useful tool. But I think, you know, what I've seen is, is that. People, investors um, are motivated to um, invest in carbon reduction. And so that mechanism might be faster and ultimately more effective to achieving these, these ends. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? John, I uh, greatly appreciate you uh, spending the time with us. And for those here, uh, John has agreed that we could put uh, his PowerPoint presentation on our webpage and uh, also a copy of the, uh, the uh, verbal uh, discussion here would also be uh, referenced on our webpage. So, so we thank you for that. And anyone who wants a professional development hour for uh, listening, please uh, send me an email, Mike Hunger at Comcast on that. Does anybody else have a last minute thing to say? What about putting a copy of Senate Bill 530 on the website for people to review? Is that something you could do? We could do that. It sounds like a good idea. Mom. You bet. Be able to support it. Yeah. So sounds like a, a a good idea. We'll do that. Well, that's well, thank you. My opener. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you everybody for for your time, and we'll see you next month. <laughs> <laughs>